the expectations going into the Algarve Cup this year after the successful year you had last year? Well, I think it is a very important tournament for us in, in many respects. Uh, first of all, we've got a new qualification campaign starting in next autumn. And uh, it is a team building time again. Uh, we have a we have a few senior players retired or retired from the international football, and uh, and then we have uh, new players coming into the squad. So it is a team building tournament in many respects, and uh, it is an extremely good tournament to see the standards also where we are, both as a team and, and uh, looking at the few individual players development. We don't get these uh, invitations to a top top tournaments so often, so we try to keep our foot foot in the in the door of the Algarve Cup as long as possible. And I know that uh, every year we are more or less been on the brink, whether going out out from the tournament. But so far our performances and also the kind kind of uh, kind hosts Portugal have been been kind enough to keep us in the tournament. It is very important for us uh, in, in many respects. We have never set any result targets as such, but obviously when, when, we, when we play we try to win every, every game. And uh, um, In the last two years when we've been there, when we won the group, the incentive has been that we've been able to play the, one, of the, one of the teams from Group A and Group B, which have been China and Norway, so we've uh, then had an opponent straight from the top as a, as a reward. The, from the efforts. This year the incentive is already in the Group C because Mexico is there so we'll, we'll have some tough games to look forward to. last couple of years finished in eight. So I'm sure in, on, in, on that front that's the goal is to do one better this year and with the confidence going in, going in as well. And that must be uh, in mind. Yeah, well, like I said, that uh, we, we haven't set any result targets on that, but every time when Wales is going on the field, they're going to win whoever who going to try to win the game, and, and that, that's, the, that's the target always. So, so we, we're going to have a three very tough games in the Group C for us, particularly because we've got a new team and lots of new players, players there. But, uh, but uh, regardless of who we play, we try to, try to win them, even Mexico. With the uh, World Cup qualifiers coming up, as you say, will you look to give everyone from the squad a game, or will you pick your best team for each game? I'm, I'm picking always the best team for the for the for the senior team, and uh, if, if any player who's there needs to earn the and the place. We have to have that respect to the to the senior team. That uh, I know we've got a, quite a lot of youngsters with us, but uh, they have to show both on and off the pitch that they are maturing and they they really are competing the place. The seniors. Yeah, what are your thoughts about having so many uh, teenagers within the squad? It's uh, it has to do with the bigger picture. We've got five under 19 players at the moment uh, with a squad, and I've been keeping them in the loop, the the candidates for the for the autumn tournament and uh, or August tournament, and I'm, I'm looking for them to show that they are maturing and they also cherish the opportunity to be involved with that environment where we have our seasoned senior team players to show them the standards of the, of the international players. Some of them uh, have been able to take on board the things and some of the players who have been on the, on the senior team camps haven't been able to do that. But that's football for you and uh, from those five players who have been selected, I'm expecting them to show that appreciation of the opportunity. It's a kind of optimum age that reaches the peak of her career? I think it's between 18 and 35. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it is individual. In general, if we look at the, the physical program, pro profile of, of each and every player, you would expect uh, physically players to peak between 26 to 32. And uh, obviously we are hoping to, to keep those, those senior team players involved as long as possible. I think that uh, we have a good example of, of Jane Ludlow who's been there for, for a number of years. Yes, and, and, and then, then again it's the balancing that when, when you are peaking as, as a football player physically and also technically, tactically at that age, then it comes to finding the right, right balance with the training and, and loading, training and playing and managing 
managing yourself, and I think that's that, that's the important thing. So any Michelle looking at this list, any Michelle Green is getting anywhere near what you consider to be the peak of, of the career. Yeah, Michelle, Michelle is one of our our, our most experienced players. I think she's she has the most caps from our from our team. But I think that she she's also been in the situation which uh, which is a bit of a challenge that we, we had the England Super League. Um, we've had them that for two years and they're playing summer football where the competitive season actually is very short. And last two years she's she's been in the optimal age in many respects, but. Uh, she almost lost one year because the England season stopped and they all the teams had a, had a 10, 10 months pre-season. So it's always an individual situation where you, I'm looking into to every player as an individual and, and some of them peak earlier, some of them peak, peak later. But obviously the situation and the challenge for us as a, as, a, as a football nation is that we keep our female players within the national team squad long. And how do you see the um, relative merits of players playing in the English setup and the Welsh setup at the moment? Then, well, again, it's an individual thing, and what, if if you have a competition season which runs uh, roughly five months, and then you during that compet competitive season you are seven weeks uh, on on a break because there are major tournaments, that is a huge challenge for individual players. And and during this these two years, the players who have been been with the Super Leagues in England, I've, I've clearly seen that not all the individual players are benefiting from it because that requires that their club is survive, providing them support out of season. Some of the clubs do, some of the clubs don't. And uh, in the England system, when, when it changed, uh, the, the Premier League clubs became overnight Super League clubs with the same coaches, with the same setup, only the status changed. But did the coaching and the preparation changed because they they are preparing for that five month season and most of them have a two month preseason. So that leaves I'm, I'm bad at math, mathematics, but that leaves some some of the clubs five months out of out of football and out of out of program. That is a real challenge for individual players. In general, the the club football with Super League comp competitive uh, wise of competitiveness is, is better. But it's also in relation to the length of the season. In in general, the England Premier League is is, is a is a reasonably good good league. But again, if you need to travel to those clubs very early stages, and again if you get a training once or twice a week and you get a game, you have to ask yourself a question: which which is best for me as an individual? International players need training and they need games and they need that 365 days in a year. That's my experience, that uh, you, you need to be very, very clever to manage yourself and also finding a club which actually supports you in, in every way. So you're saying you'd like the English clubs to have a longer fixture list, more matches over the season? No, I'm not saying no, that. I would, I would like to have a relation between those ma matches and the length of the season. I think that if you have only five five month season and then you play in a short period of time, very compact, that's not ideal football-wise, and it's not ideal, obviously, players' fitness-wise. Mm -hmm. But if we have a longer season where we can train and play overall, I think that would be ideal. Mm -hmm. It's not my business to tell the FA, the big FA, to how, how to run the Super League. But uh, if I if I if I look at it purely from the football's point of view, players' point of view, it certainly leaves some questions. So when you get a squad together, I know when Chris gets his squad together. He wouldn't have to work on fitness, for example. He would work on purely the game plan for the game coming up. Would you have to work on fitness as well? We need to work on players' fitness outside the camps. We need to try to provide players support, providing them individual programs and actually providing them training sessions uh, outside, the, outside the camps because club structure and the competition structure is not yet at that level. Men's game, it is you you've touched the nerve in, in that that it's a different thing. When you when you're when you're managing men's senior team or under twenty ones or even under nineties uh, at at the men's game, the most important thing is that you get players recovered from the club activities and then prepared for the for the for the match. In the women's football it's an overall package and I think that is one of the biggest things that uh, we need to address in, in Wales and probably in the UK as well. 
uh, England, Scotland, even Northern Ireland and, and Republic of Ireland are, are further down that road than us. We need to catch up. It's obviously been um, a successful weekend for, for Welsh football as a whole, successful period for, for Welsh men's football. Does the women's game see any benefit from that in terms of increased participation numbers and maybe more players for you to choose from or your successor in a five years' time or whatever? I, I've always felt that uh, we, we are in this together, whether it's a men, men's or women's football, it's Welsh football. And uh, every time when a Welsh club has success and, 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 and Welsh national team has success or Welsh football in general has success, I think it is, uh, it's benefits everyone. Then of course it is in the, in in the FAW and other organisations to see too that we we looking at women's football as a as a whole. My biggest concern is that uh, do we really do we really perceive women's top football as top football and do we do we give that credit to that? Because I've I've been I've been working in a different football association. Now. I've been working with the international football over 15 years and I've seen how big the women's women's games elsewhere. And I think in that respect, it, uh, it is something that uh, we need to look into that area and do we give that support to the women's top players, clubs and women's top football in general that we need to. Men's top football in Wales is, is, is sustainable and self-sustainable. Women's game is not. So that is one of the ma major things that I feel that we need to address too at the football association level and as a nation level. Why do you think that is? I think it is a, it's a question of many things. Uh, what I found it, it's, it's also a cultural thing that uh, women's football hasn't hasn't really been at that status. I think we are we are always proud when Welsh female or male play, players are, are successful. But in I, I think in women's game because the the whole infrastructure and the whole structure is is is, is behind. It really needs those active uh, actions from uh, governing bodies to, to take those steps. That's the way it's done in, in, in a number of countries. I remember that was back in 2000 when I was working in Finnish Football Association and I was one of those UFA, UFA seminars and uh, I had a presentation of, of women's football development project in, in Finland. And um, I made that present, presentation after England, Kelly Simons, had hers and, and she was more or less talking about the figures, how many millions the FA and, and the government is, is putting into women's game. Then I then I went on the stage and told how many how many that that time it was marks. I, I think it was thousands or or hundreds of marks the Football Association of Finland is, is putting into it. But it is a question that there is uh, a will to do it as a nation-wise, and uh, I mentioned England because the government and government support and the FA support has been the major factor that in the last 10, 15 years England has taken the steps they have. Could, could the clubs help? I mean, I'm, I'm, you just look at the list here now and you see Chelsea, Cardiff City, Blackburn, uh, Bristol, Watford, and you know, they all are well-known men's teams. Could they help more by taking the women's game on board more? I think that is that is a good shout, but in many cases, uh, the the only common thing be, be, between uh, those those names and the clubs is that the, there is the name. Very often, the affiliation stops there. In in Super League, England Super League, I know that a couple of the of the men's club have actually affiliated and giving that support also to the to women's club, but not very often. Usually, the only common thing is the is, is the name, and that that uh, affiliation stops there. And I think it is, is, is one of those things, again, that, um, that uh, uh, the culture is, is strongly men's football dominated. And I think that that, uh, that goes all the way to the, our structures. And, and they, will, they will really need those decisions that, uh, that uh, we take women's football forward with, uh, with the public support. Club support is very important if we have that. I've always felt that... Uh, from a professional club's point of view, there are so many things that actually that that uh, men's club can can gain from that support. If we look at the big clubs and the resources they have, I think that uh, that support that 
would be needed with the women's game is marginal. Very often it's the case of, of having the, the access to the facilities and, and, and giving that, even if it's a medical support, that, that, that type of support. And in return, those clubs would gain massively with image-wise. I think that uh, one of the big and strong things in, in UK football is that uh, community feeling. And I would, I, would, I would imagine that type of uh, uh, PR and, and promotional gains would be very useful for every club. You know, I could, uh, perhaps, just ask you to say a few words on, on a couple of the new faces, specifically in the uh, in the squad. Um, so those people may not be too uh, too used to some of the uh, the names that we have. Yep. Um, first of all, we've had a difficult Christmas period and, and the turn of the year regarding the injuries. I know that we played a we played a friendly in November and we played a friendly in January, and uh, a number of senior senior players uh, had picked up injuries and, and clearly coming back to what I said about the challenge for the Super League players that big break, long break had uh, unfortunately done the damage in, in, in a number of occasions. So we've had a three, three event period, November, January and also, also the Algarve Cup when we have a lot of youngsters also due to the fact that senior team players injury is, 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 is too long. But we've got experienced players and then we've got a new players who haven't really been involved and, and then we've got young players and I, I always like that mix. And I said for the young players it is to, for them to understand that it's a unique opportunity and, and for them to step up and reply to that challenge. I know that our senior team players have been, many of them are not, not um, like our captain, she's very young still but she's a young, experienced player, and, and they are great role models to the young, younger players, and also to the players who haven't been involved with the, with the senior team. We have a few interesting ones, obviously. Kerry probably was uh, referring to Keris Hawkins, who's at the moment playing in Sweden. She signed up for the, for the Damal Svenskan Club Sunnanö, and uh, she migrated as a four-year-old girl to Australia, has played her club football five seasons there with a Perth. I think she holds the record uh, record of appearances for that Australian league club. But she also has shown interest to play for Wales because she, she was born in Cardiff and she's got Welsh background. She hasn't played for Australia, been on the regionals and be, been on the on the, on the, on the squad, but hasn't actually played and, and she's cleared to play for Wales. And uh, obviously, she's an interesting player to see. I've had, I have a very good reports on her. One of the Finnish players, Finnish national team players, is playing at the same club. And I've got a few good footages, so she'll be a very interesting defender to, to look, look into. Then, of course, we, we also, also have a Younger, younger players. We have uh, also, in a way, overloaded the defence because we, we need to rotate and look into different roles of the few of the play, players. Having uh, young defenders available, having Caris Hawkins available, uh, means that we might be able to to recheck Lauren Dykes on the, on the wing. Which will, uh, which will certainly benefit us as a team and, uh, and again be a good thing for Lauren's development. Then again we also have an interesting player up front, Sean Jones, who's uh, been in the USA and unfortunately the USA system is not necessarily supporting international players either. But she's back, she's playing in the Welsh League at the moment and uh, she's done well. And um, we had her a year and a half ago play for us uh, against Luxembourg and, and uh, she, she will be an interesting striker to, to look into and work for during the, the Algarve Cup. Then we have the five youngsters who have uh, in recent camps shown that they are, they are working hard. They have uh, also understood that uh, because they have a once in a lifetime opportunity to play in the Women Under 19 final tournament. That's not a freebie, but it is uh, also a 
responsibility for them to take care of themselves and, and work hard. And all those five players have, have really shown that they are ready to step up. And, and also, also, I know that they will appreciate the opportunity to be a part of the Alpha.